we've actually had 50 years of unusually stable weather. As a result of this, gardeners and farmers by and large have got used to gardening in what I call good times, good, good time gardening. Now we're in a period of climate change and we have much more unstable weather. What do we need now to be able to garden in times that are less predictable? Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm in Corvallis, Oregon with a plant breeder. I'm with Carol Deppie. Thanks for joining me. Glad to be with you. Well, let me tell you about this woman. Carol specializes in developing public domain crops. We'll talk about that. For organic growing conditions, for sustainable agriculture and human survival. Sounds like peak moment, doesn't it? <laughs> She's a PhD in biology from Harvard University and has been experimenting with crops and gardening in Corvallis since 1979. So her books include, among others, this one, The Resilient Gardener, Food Production and Self-Reliance in Uncertain Times, including the five crops you need to survive and thrive. Potatoes, corn, beans, squash, and eggs. Mm, that sounds so good. And we will talk about that. And the Tao of vegetable gardening, cultivating tomatoes, greens, peas, beans, squash, joy, and serenity. Those two last two <laughs> sound very yummy. As well as your your earlier book on I get this. Didn't have it here. Breeder on, on Vegetable Varieties. Right. The Gardener's and Farmer's Guide to Plant Breeding and Seed Saving. Thank you. Thank you. We've got the whole works. <laughs> well, tell me, um, I, I am not a gardener, so I was rather surprised and delighted in The Resilient Gardener to have you cover all kinds of details that made it feel not as formidable to me. And, and part of it is, you start with the perspective of it has to taste good, mm -hmm. you know, because you're you're a foodie, foodie in a garden, and also you looked at how to do things that take less energy, less resources, that are going to work in times where we need to be resilient. So I'm going to ask you to start with telling us what do you mean by resilient for a resilient um, gardener? Okay, just to start with one thing you mentioned was. Uh, some people really actually enjoy working really hard in the garden. I don't. I would much rather just be able to sow my seeds and come back and harvest. Mm. Uh, so when I breed crops or when I experiment with gardening methods, I'm always after how do I get the most food, the most delicious food, for the absolute least possible work. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the resilience thing, I think uh, so many gardeners these days, um, we basically up until just the last few years we've had one kind of weather. We've actually had 50 years of unusually stable weather. As a result of this, gardeners and farmers by and large have got used to gardening in what I call good times. Good, good time gardening. Uh, that's actually not what we need when you look at larger scale times. A thousand years, how many how many periods do we have where there's 50 years of almost always good weather? No, not really. And Now we're in a period of climate change and we have much more unstable weather. And it's not necessarily that your backyard is going to be warmer, for example, because it may be colder or wetter. Or it all depends upon how the overall wind patterns and and the overall planetary weather patterns shift. Uh, but whatever else, your backyard and your garden are a whole lot less stable than they used to be. It's a lot less predictable and being able to garden or farm in any given region uh, has a whole lot to do with the predictability of what your weather is going to be like. That is all changing now. So you know, what, what do we need now to be able to garden in times that are less predictable. Uh, and 
you know, to figure that out, one of the things I looked at was what people discovered in the Little, little Ice Age, because all of a sudden, essentially, one spring, they were in a completely different weather pattern. In the Little Ice in, Age, in, yeah, in, in, in Europe, yeah. As, in Europe as well as uh, in North America. <coughs> You know, it started raining and it basically didn't stop. Uh, and it was colder and it stayed colder and more predictable. Mm -hmm. Peasants in Europe had been just grain farmers. Grain was a bad thing to grow because, uh, you know, it was no longer reliable because it's got these big heavy heads that uh, lodge if, if you get a storm uh, and, you know, just fall to the ground mm -hmm. and rot. Uh, so all of a sudden, in the Little Ice Age, Euro European uh, farmers had to learn to, to farm differently. And those are actually the patterns that we brought with us as pioneers to this country. And you know, we lost them when we came into this period of great stability. So when you look at that historical uh, situation, you see, well, one of the things is you grow a whole lot of different crops. You don't depend upon just one food because even at, at best, whole crops can fail, so you want other crops. Another thing is that you try to have gardening or farming patterns that um, vary from time of year. So say here in Maritime, Oregon, uh, I can grow the ordinary summer beans that are the common beans, but I can also grow fava beans over the winter. So if some disaster happens at one time of year, some of my crops are not even dependent upon that time of year. Okay. Uh, another, another approach that I suggest to people is uh, if you're dealing with uh, unstable times, uh, short season crops are a real premium. For the maximum production, you usually want a crop that's full season for your area. So you would have a corn, for example, that you put in the ground as early as possible and you harvest at the last minute. That's fine if everything's stable and if the as early as possible in the last minute are reproducible from year to year. Try to do that now, not so good. Um, so in, in with respect to my own uh, breeding and growing of, of uh, corn and beans especially, for example, I really focused on short season varieties. So put it in the ground in the spring, some sort of disaster happens, you can replant, still get a crop. Uh, up until this last summer, the four summers before that, we had unusually cold weather. Well, because of the fact that I was growing uh, and, and developing uh, short season corns, they just took longer, but they still <laughs> the tour just fine. If I had instead been focusing on long, long season varieties, I'd have been out of luck. They wouldn't have matured. Uh, likewise, you know, if you have a disaster at the end of the season, it doesn't matter because your short season crop is already out of the ground by then. So there's just much to be said for short season crops. And, uh, if you're a commercial farmer, you I, I suggest you do a mix. You, mm -hmm. you do some full season crops in case you've got a good year. You do some short season crops in case your full season crops don't, you know, they mm -hmm. bite the dust. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, if you're planting trees, uh, fruit trees for example, one of the things you have to take into account is you don't really care about the average freeze in the winter. What you care about, because the, the trees, in order to be successful, they've got to make it through the really rotten year, too. Uh, so a lot of people will say, well, now with global warming, warming and experiment planting fruit trees that um, are adapted for a zone that's warmer than where you were. And I say, nonsense. Go in the other direction you want it. <laughs> because now we can have greater extremes. Right, so right. even though we might have warmer, whether on average, the average does not matter. What matters is the lows uh -huh. Uh -huh. or the highs. You right. know, depending on what you're talking right. about. Uh, so I, I suggest that people be more conservative than ever mm -hmm. with respect to growing fruit trees. And on the other hand, when it comes to the annual vegetables, eh, play, you know, experiment. Go ahead and try things that are uh, in the past. You know, if you're if you're actually experimenting in your uh, or experiencing in your own backyard warmer weather, uh, go ahead and pl plant some stuff that 
this warm weather adapted. Greater variability and unpredictability of the weather, weather patterns matters a whole lot more. Uh, one other thing I would suggest is that uh, when it comes to the balance between uh, garden crops that you uh, self you, you sow seed as opposed to transplants, mm -hmm. there's much much more of a premium now in using transplanting uh, because if you've got your Crops are tucked away in a greenhouse for the first month. <laughs> yeah, you've got to start. That gives you, you a, it gives you some leeway. Yes, yes. So if you get some something rotten happen during that whole period, you're, you're covered because you've got still those covered, right? happily in, in the greenhouse. Yeah. yeah, I've seen a lot of greenhouses as we've traveled here in the Northwest. It looks like it's and, and simple ones, little so houses mm -hmm. exactly. that can be lifted quickly um, to extend the season. Really, uh -huh. to exactly. get started yeah. to do it sooner. Well, two other things I'd mention with respect to the uh, overall uh, issue of resilience uh, is uh, minimum inputs. You're better off finding varieties or creating varieties if you're into uh, plant breeding and adapting varieties to your own conditions. You're better off uh, developing varieties that don't require uh, really serious inputs that can give barn relatively minimal mm -hmm. inputs. Because if you had a real disaster hit, like the next next mega night earthquake or something, you could be cut off. You know, so you're you not going to get the fertilizer, fertilizer that you need, or and you might not get seed. So that's the mm -hmm. other thing that I would suggest is that uh, either learn seed saving and start saving some of your your own seed, or uh, if you don't want to do that, hoard seed. Everybody talks about seed saving, but you don't have to save the seed. Uh, in the in the good years where you wouldn't even buy seed. Instead, if you simply learn how to dry it properly and freeze it, uh, you have to dry it properly because most seed is too wet to freeze when it comes from the mm -hmm. seed company. So you dry it a little bit extra in a dehydrator uh, and then you uh, then you freeze it. Uh, so you've got a stash put away and you can just forget about it. Uh, and then if something bad happens you can start saving the seed. <laughs> you know, as long as you've got the seed, if you've got a stash of seed, mm -hmm. you can start saving it at that point. You know, just tuck a book on seed saving away too. <laughs> you know, well, you might have to learn it on the fly, right? You might have to learn it on the fly. But you've got. But what you're talking about really is a, a security. I, I hear that right. everywhere. That resilience is about having you know, duplications and exactly. redundancy, so you have the security exactly. of having that. One of the things I always think in terms of, uh, and, and I suggest, well, two things. One is, uh, don't think in terms of just the next year or e even your own life. Think in terms of the next thousand years. Mm -hmm. uh, because this gives you a kind of perspective for the sort of things that happen to people. And gardeners frequently, gardeners and small farmers are frequently the people that get us through That's right. those That's times. Right. You know, times of war, for example, victory gardens, you know, they're part of what kept people going. Uh, well, in order to uh, to have functional gardens in really bad times, you know, mega nine earthquakes, one or, one or two of them every thousand years, the next time that that happens in Oregon, we aren't going to have any bridges or roads. It's true. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know. Thinking of that, I can say to myself, okay, well, I want us to have lots of gardens. I want everybody to have their own do-it-yourself seed bank and tucked away in their freezer uh, and uh, know how to save seed uh, and have enough seeds so that, and this is the other thing I always mention, think in long terms to help yourself understand what are the kinds of things human beings have to deal with and what's the role of gardeners in helping humanity survive through all of these things. But then the second thing is it has to be not just yourself and your, your family you're thinking of. You've got to at the very least be thinking of your community, your neighborhood, because uh, if uh, you're in a situation where suddenly something has happened, you know, it could be something small, be just your family runs out of money or nobody has a job or whatever, so all of a sudden you're really dependent on your garden. But if it's some big, bigger thing that affects your whole region or your, uh, your whole city or neighborhood, you've got to be in a situation where you, could, you have got enough seed that you can share with neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's not going to do you a whole lot of good 
uh, to, to be the only person with a garden in the neighborhood. You know, lots of luck harvesting anything out of that if, if you're the, yeah. so, yeah. so. So if you have everybody. You know, you cannot growing. easily store enough food to feed your whole neighborhood, yeah. but you can really easily store enough seed to supply planting seed for your whole neighborhood. Grand. Yeah. Ooh, I think that's, that's a primo idea. Yeah. Speaking of which, I'm going to jump over to your your five, you know, the five crops you need to survive and thrive, because you've worked at developing those breeds that with many of the qualities that you've talked about. Short some of them. <laughs> some of them as well. Haven't bought any potatoes, but why those crops? Yeah, why those crops? And you uh -huh. eggs, and you love ducks, but let's let's talk about the yeah. crops in particular. Right. Um, the uh, the ones I've uh, I've worked on breeding myself for the corn beans and squash. Uh, so let me start with potatoes and talk about <laughs> why that has to be part of the, yeah. the list. Uh, potatoes, practically speaking, are actually just a wet grain. They have got a very high protein content as well as a high carbohydrate content. They're very easy to grow on a, on a backyard or a small farm scale. If you had to uh, dig up your your backyard and turn it into a wheat patch. Lots of luck because you need a fine seed bed for a wheat patch. Mm. You basically need what amounts to a tractor. Uh, with, a pota with potatoes, all you really need is a shovel. Uh, you can go and strip the sod off and, and make a potato bed and there you go. They don't require a whole lot of fertility. Uh, they yield more calories more carbohydrate per unit space than any other crop if you're talking about temperate zone. Uh -huh. Now here's the, the surprise. They yield more protein per unit space than any other crop. It's comparable to beans really. Wow. Because so people don't quite realize this because we talk about protein with respect to grains, and mm -hmm. you know, eighteen percent is a really high, you know, for wheat. I mean, wheat's run all the way from ten percent or so to eighteen uh, percent. So even the wheats that have got the most protein in them, talking about eighteen percent or so, well, that's basically on a dry weight basis. Potatoes, you're talking about, say, two percent. But most of that is water. water. If you're yeah. talking about the actual food part, you're right up there close to where wheat is. The better, higher protein varieties of yeah. wheat. Uh, and furthermore, the uh, protein that's in the potatoes is better balanced and it's more digestible, whereas uh, the wheat protein is not that, not as easy to digest. Right, for all of us. So, all of us. yes. So, if a person were eating just proteins, or excuse me, just uh, potatoes as their, as their main diet, the, the ratio of calories and protein is actually so well balanced that it actually would be all the protein that many people would need. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're talking about people that are actually laboring pretty hard, so they're eating more like three to 5,000 calories a day, it's way more protein than they actually need. Mm -hmm. So this is why uh, in, uh, in the days of the, before the potato famine, uh, the Irish peasants and European peasants in general were, dealing, were depending so heavily on the potato. It gave them virtually everything they needed. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. toss in a few garden greens, you know, a little bit of milk, you should have the situation covered. Wow, great. Uh, so it's absolutely wonderful food. Uh, there's all kinds of different flavors, you know, you can store. The disadvantage to potatoes is you can't store them for more than, you can store them in a climate like this, an attached garage, we stored potatoes right through spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's about it. Yeah, you and, can't. You know, I, the, yeah. And that's good storing varieties. Uh, so the other crops that I deal with, them, uh, well, the squash again is another thing that usually you're going to eat, be able to store good storing types through spring. Uh, the corn and beans, you can keep those for more than a year. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and there are times when you look over periods of a thousand years, there's times where uh, in not only in specific regions, but even looking on the world basis where nobody could do agriculture successfully at all for a period of a few years. Um, there was a, you know, a period I think it was 500 or something uh, AD. Um, people have looked at tree rings and the tree ring, the, basically the trees quit growing all over the world. People have not totally figured out why. They think some volcano blew up big time at that point. Uh, when they look back at uh, records from uh, some civilizations, like uh, the Japanese and the Chinese, for example, they have records that go that far back, uh, people were saying things like, the sun is red all day, it's only out for a few hours and gives no heat. Can you imagine what that was like? And this is just in the last couple thousand years. Um, so. I think that if you're thinking in terms of trying to, you know, be a you know, fulfill your full role as a as a gardener or a small farmer and try to help your your family and your neighborhood survive all the sorts of things that can happen, when you look at these bigger ranges of time, you see sometimes there's no food production yeah. for years. So that's where the beans and the grains come in. Because those you can, you know, if you grow them yourself, you can have a backlog so that you've not only got enough seed to grow the next year, year's crop, and enough seed for your whole neighborhood to be able to plant all of their lawns and grain, but but you can backlog enough of those, and with the squash and the potatoes, they extend your harvest many months when you know how to store them. Mm -hmm. But you really need the grains and the grain legumes in order to to take you over the threshold where you just have crop failures. Um, the Hopi Indians had a tradition that any year that they had a harvest they tried to put away enough seed for two years Ooh, at the very least. Smart. They had mm -hmm. plenty of years in which they didn't get a crop. Mm -hmm. So they needed to Need, needed to have at least seed, uh, right. enough seed to plant, to put yes. away. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think we need to think in those kind of terms. So, so grain and grain legumes. Well, the beans are really easy. The dried beans are really easy. When it comes to uh, to grains, uh, one of the reasons for focusing on corn is that. Uh, of all of the grains, it's the one that's the easiest to grow on the backyard scale with just simple hand tools. Uh, with, uh, with the small grains, basically you need fine seed beds. That means you need a tractor or tillage or at least a rototiller. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You can't just go and easily convert a lawn into a fine seed I mean, bed for, for wheat or oats or, or, or barley. Or with or corn, uh, the Indians grew fine corn crops with nothing but what amounted to a hoe, which was like my what I call the peasant hoe, but it was made from a shoulder blade of a, of a bison or an, or an antelope, uh, you know, mounted on a stick. So that was their hoe. And they had a digging stick. And, you know, they could dig up a patch and plant the corn in hills. That's partly the reason why they were planting corn in the hills all the time, was they didn't have tillage equipment. Uh, so they couldn't plant, you know, a solid field the way the pioneers in a got sense, here. They just so they the would just, just dig up a little hole, uh -huh. you know, and then skip two yards, and dig up another little hole, uh, and, and make little hills. So corn is the easy thing to grow on a, mm -hmm. on a backyard scale, and if you, if you need to, just that year because something has happened, you need to suddenly turn a whole bunch of lawns into yeah. food patches, corn would be absolutely the easiest thing to do. Fabulous. Uh, Fabulous. Yes. Beans are very easy to do too, as long as you've got, you know, varieties that are suitable for your area. Uh, Speaking of which, varieties here in our last minute about that we have, that's mm -hmm. what you do, is yeah. you breed for particular, right. so, so tell us, and in addition, so I, I want to know what your seed company name is so that people can find you. Fertile Valley Seeds. Fertile Valley Seeds. Right. Yeah. Yes. And your website. 
It's www.caroldeppy.com. With two P's. Yes. C A R O L D E P I dot com. Yes, yeah. thank you. Fertile Valley is after Willamette Valley, but you know it's also an illusion. It's a Taoist illusion. The Fertile Valley is the source of creativity and bounty mm. that flows over to the rest of the land. And I want to have you just give the, a word here is that you're doing open source. What does that mean uh, in your seeds? They're open pollinated public domain varieties. You. you can take the seed and you can do anything you want with it. You can use it to breed other things. You can grow it and sell it yourself. It's so it's it, what I see this. It's your gift to the world, really. Yeah, yeah. Is the work that you are doing to, so part of how you make a living at this is selling the seeds, and yet you're yeah. giving them away in a sense yeah. also. And uh, so there's all kinds of ways that you could grow seeds that would probably be more profitable. But I think one of the big difficulties uh, has been the conversion in the last few decades of what was a public heritage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. into private germplasm that's, yeah. that's you know, it's either hybrids, so you have to do a lot of work in order to pull new varieties out to get anywhere that doesn't breed true, uh, or it's patented or plant variety protected so that you're legally forbidden to, to fully possess and do what you want with the seed. So I feel very strongly about the, the heritage of people owning the, the food germplasm. So, uh, I'm one of the, we're always small scale plant breeders, uh, who basically does the opposite of what all the big seed companies at this point, what most of the university professors are doing, and that is uh, deliberately breeding varieties that, uh, that we release fully as public domain material. I want to say for everyone. For everyone. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> you. thank you. And, and those two there. And thank you for this conversation. It's, it's been, been fun. Rich. <laughs> You're watching Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm with Carol Deppy, who's a woman who's thinking beyond a thousand years and having us all be fed. Join us next time.